Hello everybody, in chapter six we're gonna be talking about e-commerce marketing and advertising concepts. Starting out with a short discussion here, so uh, you know what advantages do video ads have over traditional banner ads? Where do sites such as YouTube fit into a marketing strategy featuring video ads? And then do you think internet users will ever develop blindness toward video ads uh, as they have towards display ads? So uh, just kind of go, you know, start from the top here. So, you know, what advantages do video ads have over traditional banner ads? I think for the most part, it just kind of grabs somebody's attention you know, right off the bat. You know, they see a video moving, they're a little more apt to kind of go to that video and start watching it, um, especially if you do have... Uh, you know the sound enabled on those videos um, it's going to definitely draw your attention onto it from the start whereas you know a typical you know banner ad it might have some flashy graphics or something but it doesn't have that sound you know associated with it so you know where do sites such as YouTube fit into a marketing strategy featuring video ads uh, YouTube has really kind of honed in on uh, you know video ads as far as pretty much any video that you watch on YouTube anymore it has an ad you know at the very start of it um, so you know they're a huge player in video advertising and then do you think internet users will ever develop blindness toward video ads and as they have towards some display ads uh, yeah I think we're kind of already there where uh, you know <clears throat> I know with like YouTube videos where you can you know after five seconds either skip through the ad um, or you know uh, even bypass the ad if you can fill out a survey different things like that um, <clears throat> I think for the most part people are just kind of sick of ads um, and they don't even really pay attention to what the ad is it's just one of those things where it's just like just get through it as quickly as possible because I want to get to the video that I'm watching um, so yeah I definitely kind of think we're already there towards that blindness uh, so whenever you're going online um, and making you know online purchases um, kind of goes through you know five stages in consumer decision process um, so you're gonna you know come to the awareness of the need uh, you know, you're going to search for more information about kind of what you're buying, uh, evaluation of alternatives. So, you know, if, are you deciding between, uh, you know, company A, B, and company C? Um, you've got the actual purchase decision, and then you've got the post-purchase uh, contact, you know, with that firm. Did they do any follow-up with you uh, to see, you know, if you liked the a purchase? You know, did you buy like a time, you know, a Timex watch or something like that? Did they send you an email to, you know, write a review or something? So, you know, all of those would be, you know, kind of a post-purchase contact with the firm. Uh, you know, <clears throat> as far as, you know, decision process, uh, you know, similar for online and offline behavior. Uh, so general online behavior model, so uses characteristics, uh, product characteristics, you know, website features uh, such as latency, usability, security, uh, attitude, attitudes toward online purchasing, and then perceptions about control over web environment. Uh, so, you know, click stream behavior, a uh, huge player in that. So you've got uh, browsers versus buyers. Uh, you know, online, so shoppers, over 90% of internet users um, are shoppers. Uh, so, you know, around 80% of those are buyers, and then around 13% are buyers uh, who just purchase offline. So these are the individuals that maybe go out online, uh, you know, they're researching a little bit more, and then they're actually going to make the purchase, like, in-store um, for it. So, and then online research uh, influenced about uh, 2.6 trillion of uh, retail purchases in 2017. Uh, online traffic also influenced by offline brands and shopping. So maybe you, you might see something at a store someplace. Uh, maybe you don't have the time um, to go in and look at it, but you think, oh, I'm going to go online um, and look for it. Uh, and then you, uh, you know, do that later on uh, whenever it's a little more uh, you know, time convenient for you. Uh, E-commerce and traditional uh, commerce are coupled, so part of a continuum um, of consuming behavior. So that's why you do see uh, you know, a lot of people who do still have you know, brick and mortar stores um, along with you know, an online website um, just because they kind of go hand in hand where a lot of people, especially like if it's something like clothes, they want to go in, they want to try it on, they actually want to feel the fabrics uh, instead of just buying something online. Uh, I'm a little more new school in this where I pretty much do all my shopping online uh, for like clothing. I'll have it you know, sent to me. Uh, the big kind of sticking point with me is I'll look for places that have you know, free delivery um, and free returns. Um, so, you know, I'll you know get something. If I don't like it, then I'll just send it back to them. And then, you know, it's not that much of a, you know, difference to me. Uh, you know, it might be a little bit of an inconvenience because I have to stop by, you know, either the post office or UPS or something to send it back. Uh, but for the most part, I don't mind that just because I can, you know, avoid getting out of the house, going to like the mall uh, or a store someplace, uh, you know, and having to deal with a bunch of people that I normally wouldn't have to deal with. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, I, d I definitely think... Uh, you know, having that on online presence as well as the in-store, though, uh, for most companies, uh, definitely serves a purpose. 
So what consumers shop for and buy online? So a lot of the big ticket items, these are gonna be $1,000 or more. So some of those uh, would be you know, travel, uh, computer hardware, or electronics. You got consumers now more confident in purchasing, you know, costlier items. Whereas maybe 10 years ago, uh, people weren't buying such big ticket items. Um, I think you know, reviews have had a really big play into that, to where you can go online, you can kind of see what other people are saying about it, seeing what kind of what concerns that you have. Whereas in years past, if you went into a store, you might not have a user review with that. You might just have like a salesman or saleswoman kind of talking to you about the product that you're wanting to buy. Uh, you know, maybe you did a little bit of research into it, but a lot of times people just kind of go in blind into those situations. So you just kind of have one person's opinion um, compared to, you know, many opinions that might be out there. Uh, you know, some of the smaller ticket items, these are going to be $100 or less people are buying, you know, online. So, you know, such as apparel, books, office supplies, software, et cetera. So, you know, I think... Uh, you know, majority of, uh, you know, shopping um, is more of those kind of smaller ticket items. Uh, you know, the one thing that, you know, you don't see on like a big ticket item is something like a car. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people do, uh, you know, buy, you know, cars online, whether it be, you know, from a you know, private individual somewhere here in the United States or something like that. Uh, I, I just think whenever you start getting a little more money invested into something, um, especially, you know, such as a car, which is a very, you know, personable item where, you know, people can be a little more finicky about it, um, especially like, uh, you know, if you want to make sure that the car, nobody has smoked in it or anything like that. I mean, you can have somebody online tell you, oh, yeah, like nobody smoked in this car. But until you're actually like, sitting in the car uh, and seeing it and smelling it for yourself, you might not believe them. So, um, you know, kind of going along with that. So sales of, you know, bulky goods such as furniture or large appliances are rapidly expanding. Uh, you know, to go along with that, I think that, you know, uh, you know, online reviews have played kind of a huge role into that. Um, you know, we actually just bought a recliner online, which was kind of a, you know, first for you know, my wife and I. Uh, we have not bought any large appliances online. We've still kind of been old school with that as far as going to, you know, like a Lowe's or Home Depot, Menards, whatever it might be, uh, looking for appliances there. But, uh, yeah, we did buy a recliner, uh, you know, online. My wife did a lot of research with it, uh, you know, found some pretty good reviews, you know, liked what she wanted. Uh, the good thing with it is, you know, it did come with, you know, free shipping and free returns on it. So, you know, if we didn't like it, we just had to send it back. So, uh, you know, we weren't out anything uh, really on it. It was just kind of an inconvenience if we did have to send it back just because it was a little bit of a heavier, you know, item. But uh, I know we're kind of in the market for a new couch here shortly. So um, going to be interested to see if we, uh, you know, go online to actually buy that. I'm assuming we'll probably end up going to a furniture store uh, to buy that, but we'll probably do you know, quite a bit of the research online. Uh, so some of the, you know, how consumers shop in nowadays. So uh, how shoppers find online vendors. So, you know, highly uh, intentional and goal oriented. Uh, you know, you got search engines um, that kind of help you uh, go to the different websites. You got marketplaces such as Amazon and eBay, and then you have very specific retail sites uh, for whatever you're trying to buy. Uh, about 8% of internet users don't shop online. Uh, reason behind this is you know trust factor and then also hassle factors such as shipping uh, costs returns etc uh, my parents are part of that eight percent my parents are very old school they don't like buying anything online which is really kind of funny because my mom buys a bunch of stuff through catalogs still um, and I kind of give her a hard time for that I'm just like you know you can go online and do kind of the same thing and you don't have to call anybody and you don't have to fill out like a form and mail it off or anything and I don't know she I just can't get through to her she seems to kind of be still stuck <laughs> in the 1990s where she wants to do everything through catalog so I guess you know to each its own but you know there are still you know that older generation I uh, you would assume that uh, is part of that 8% where you know they just don't trust you know going out you know online we talked about you know last chapter as far as you know uh, security uh, measures I think that kind of plays a role into it where a lot of people just don't want their credit card information out there you know don't trust uh, you know online sites uh, with their information uh, you know, trust, utility, and uh, opportunism um, in online markets. So uh, two most important factors uh, shaping decisions to purchase online. So you've got the utility, uh, which is better prices, convenience, and speed. Uh, you can go out, you can look for, um, you know, an item and find out exactly, you know, what is going to be the best price for it. You've got the convenience of shopping from your own home, uh, you know, especially if it's during the winter time, you don't have to get out in the snow and the cold and deal with anything. And then you also have the speed, you know, Amazon Prime. That's great because you can get anything through Prime for two days, you know, shipping. So that's definitely, you know, a great uh, factor as far as Amazon Prime goes. Uh, you've got the trust um, part of it. So that's just the perception of credibility, ease of use, perceived risk. 
Uh, you know, sellers develop trust by building strong reputations for honesty, fairness, and delivery. Uh, you know, if it's you know, <clears throat> a big website, maybe like an Amazon or a Walmart or something like that, they definitely have credibility. They be definitely have the ease of use. And then, you know, as far as perceived risk, there's not a whole lot associated with that. Um, you know, if it's a lesser known website, I know like my wife, she just bought uh, some uh, <clears throat> blackout shades uh, for our home. Um, and I'm trying to think of the name of the company, but it it was like blackoutshades.com or something, but uh, went out to the website. It was kind of a sketchy looking website, wasn't very sure of it. And she actually had heard about it from a blogger. Um, and even the blogger had said in their blog, like, hey, like this doesn't look like all that, you know, user friendly um, from the outside looking in, but, you know, I didn't have any issues with them. Uh, you know, they shipped super fast and everything. So my wife took that blogger's, uh, <clears throat> you know, a word on it and then we ended up buying it and uh, yeah it was a super easy you know, transaction uh, you know they got us the blinds you know super quickly and you know we've got them now and uh, you know absolutely love them so uh, definitely a kind of a unique situation uh, where you know if you do have those kind of smaller websites you know your perceived risk uh, definitely goes up on it uh, multi-channel marketing plan so uh, you know you've got your website I'm doing a little bit of the marketing you've got traditional online marketing such as you know search engines uh, display email you know affiliates uh, social marketing such as social networks blogs videos uh, you know and also games uh, mobile marketing such as mobile and tablet sites you've got apps and then you've got offline marketing such as television radio newspapers and your old school marketing so strategic issues and questions um, to ask. So, you know, which part of the marketing plan should you focus on first? Uh, you know, I think that kind of depends on what kind of, uh, you know, item uh, that you're selling. You know, how do you integrate the different platforms for a coherent message? Uh, you know, how do you allocate resources? So uh, how do you measure and compare metrics from different platforms? Then how do you link uh, each uh, to sales revenue? So, you know, kind of going back to my original point, you know, kind of depends on you know, what kind of product and service um, that you're selling. Uh, <clears throat> you know, if you're selling like a certain product, maybe you're selling, uh, I don't know, socks. And, uh, you know, it's pretty easy uh, to kind of measure the success of that to see, you know, how many, uh, you know, orders that you're getting for it. Um, you can go out there, you know, Google Analytics has a lot of um, tools for small businesses uh, that you can use to see, you know, how many people are visiting your site based on, you know, clicking on Google. Um, you know, if your site is getting a lot of foot traffic, uh, you know, and but you're not getting a lot of sales, you know, then at that point, kind of looking at maybe you're like a price point um, and figuring out, you know, maybe my socks are a little too expensive. Uh, you know, maybe they're, you know, just not different enough. Uh, maybe somebody, you know, maybe I'm just selling just plain white socks and most people want an option. Maybe they want black or white socks or maybe they want blue socks, green socks, you know, whatever it might be. So uh, maybe kind of doing, uh, you know, kind of like some online you know, polls and research uh, going out there on, you know, online um, to uh, like a social, you know, network, you know, doing polls with that, getting some customer engagement. Uh, so all of those uh, can be good kind of uh, resources to have. Uh, so as far as establishing the customer relationship, so, you know, website functions to, you know, establish brand identity and uh, customer expectations. Uh, so differentiating a product, and you, you've got to anchor the brand online, so central point for all marketing messages. Uh, so this is, you know, to inform and educate a customer and then shape customer experience. So if you do have somebody who is, you know, uh, unfamiliar with a product, the first thing they're probably going to do is go online um, and uh, look at your website and uh, kind of figure out, you know, what is your product? Why is your product better than, you know, your competitors? Uh, and then, you know, probably looking at price. Uh, you know, one of the big things that I always hate is whenever I go out online um, and, you know, I go to a website and I'm searching for something and they don't give me the price uh, for a product online. You know, it says something like, you know, call a store uh, or call, you know, um, <clears throat> one of our sales representatives to, you know, figure out the, uh, you know, price of it. You know, that's one of my annoyances whenever, uh, you know, shopping online. So, it's all about, you know, kind of shaping that customer experience um, and figuring out, you know, what is an annoyance for our uh, customers and then what are our customers, you know, really looking for. As far as online advertising, so these are going to be, you know, display, uh, search, mobile messaging, sponsorships, classifieds, uh, you know, lead generation, and also emails. Uh, advantages of this, so you've got that, you know, younger generation of the 18 to 34 uh, audience that are online, uh, ad targeting to individuals uh, through, you know, data mining, which we'll go over here shortly. Uh, you've got uh, price discrimination, and then you also have personalization associated with it as well. So search engine uh, marketing and advertising. So search engine marketing, uh, this is going to be just the use of search engines for branding. 
search engine advertising. So use of search engines to support direct sales uh, and then types of search engine advertising. So uh, paid inclusion or uh, pay per click uh, search ads and then uh, keyword uh, advertising. So uh, network keyword advertising. Uh, and continue on. So we uh, have search engine optimization, uh, Google search engine algorithms, uh, social search, uh, which utilizes social contacts and social graph to provide fewer and uh, more relevant results. And then also search engine uh, issues, uh, which include uh, paid inclusion, placement practices, uh, link farms, uh, content farms, and also click fraud um, with that. So, you know, overall, <coughs> if you are using uh, search engine, you know, marketing uh, and advertising, uh, you know, Google is probably going to be your uh, you know, best bet with that and probably the most popular uh, between um, all of them. I know my wife, she runs, you know, online boutiques, so she does quite a bit with search engine uh, marketing. Uh, you know, the name of her online boutique in, is Megan Marie. Uh, so pretty much anything that, uh, you know, anybody who's searching for as far as like Meg or, or Marie or anything like that, um, you know, they try to <clears throat> incorporate that uh, into their search results um, as much as possible. You've got display ad marketing, um, which this is just like banner ads that you see on websites, uh, rich media ads, um, you've got video ads, which are far more effective uh, than any other display formats. We talked about that at the uh, beginning of the chapter. Uh, you've got sponsorship, and then you've got native advertising. Uh, you've got content marketing, uh, advertising networks, ad exchanges, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and then you also have display advertising issues, which include, you know, ad fraud, viewability, and then also ad blocking, which, you know, ad blocking is probably one of the biggest ones just because you don't have those pop-ups uh, anymore, especially if you're using something like a Firefox or a Chrome uh, to where you can shut off those uh, pop-ups. Email marketing, uh, you know, direct email marketing. Uh, these are messages sent directly to interested users. Uh, benefits include, you know, it's very inexpensive, um, average around 3% uh, to 4% click-throughs. Uh, measuring uh, and tracking responses um, <clears throat> and then you also have personalization and targeting you know with that if you do have somebody visiting your website um, you can uh, <clears throat> you know th through the use of cookies figure out you know exactly what product they were looking for and then you can send them a, a, like a follow-up email uh, later on saying oh you know you forgot this or you know I see you're interested in you know this product you know the three main challenges you know associated with that is you know spam uh, anti-spam software and then poorly targeted purchased uh, email list so uh, you know with the spam a lot of times uh, your websites will send you like an email um, and then it'll, uh, you know after a certain amount of time if you're either not looking at those um, you know emails anymore they'll just go into your spam folder and then at that point you know it's not very effective at all uh, other types of traditional online marketing so you've got affiliate marketing which is just a commission fee uh, paid to other websites for sending uh, customers to their websites Another thing with affiliate marketing um, that you're starting to see now is like with bloggers uh, where, or like Instagram, you know, stars. Uh, if you do have somebody who is, you know, like Instagram star or like a really big blogger or something like that, if they, you know, promote like an item um, or a brand or something, um, you know, they get, you know, <clears throat> a commission or maybe they get, uh, you know, percentage of the proceeds uh, from the sales of that day. Viral marketing, which is marketing designed to inspire customers to pass messages uh, to others. And then you've got the lead generation uh, marketing, which services and tools for collecting, managing, uh, and converting leads. Uh, social marketing and advertising. Uh, this is just the use of online social networks and communities. Uh, you got mobile marketing and advertising, which is the use of mobile platform, uh, influence of mobile apps, and then you got local marketing, uh, such as you know geo targeting, display ads, and uh, you know, hyper local publications, and also coupons. Geo targeting. Um, that's something that's pretty interesting, um, actually, just because you know if you do have uh, <clears throat> your location um, uh, setting on your cell phone they can send you, you know, different ads. So say you're at like a car dealership and you're looking for like a car, you know, financial institutions might uh, be able to send you like messages or send you uh, like emails or anything uh, saying, you know, oh, you can get pre-approved for, you know, 3% for an auto loan or something, you know, to that effect, uh, especially if you're, you know, at the car dealership and you're looking, you know, at a website uh, such as like a Kelly Blue Book uh, or an NADA trying to figure out like a value of a car, um, you know, you're probably going to see a lot more of those ads for uh, <clears throat> either other local car dealerships or like financing options. Multi-channel marketing. So this is going to be the integration of online and offline marketing. Uh, increasing percentage of American media uh, consumers use several media uh, at once. 
So this just uh, you know reinforced branding messages across media, and then this is uh, you know the most effective multi-channel campaigns use consistent imagery across the media. Uh, so if you see, you know what and what one ad campaign um, on uh, television, you're probably going to see the same exact ad campaign uh, like on, uh, you know, the internet or something like that. So, you know, just off the top of my head, like Bud Light, um, <clears throat> you know, the Dilly Dilly ads, it, that was a consistent ad campaign um, all across their media um, points. So a little bit of a discussion here. So talking about uh, you know luxury marketing. So what distinguishes luxury marketing from ordinary uh, retail marketing? You know, what challenges do luxury retailers have in translating uh, their brands and look and feel of luxury shops into websites? You know, how has social media affected luxury marketing? Then visit uh, Net a Porter website and then what do you find there? So, uh, just overall, you know, luxury marketing that is just kind of uh, you know, promoting those luxury goods um, that uh, you know, the average consumer probably doesn't have the money for. So as far as, you know, distinguishing luxury marketing uh, from ordinary retail marketing, uh, it's going to be more about like kind of a lifestyle um, rather than just making like a, you know, a purchase. Uh, they might include words such as like an investment or something along those lines. And, you know, some of the challenges uh, associated with like luxury retailers having, you know, translating their brands um, to the look and the feel of luxury shops and at the website. So the, one of the things that, you know, with luxury retailers, um, <clears throat> not everybody has access to go to like a luxury retailer, maybe something like a Tiffany and company, a uh, Tiffany company is not everywhere in the United States. You know, it's only your, you know, more metropolitan areas, such as like a Chicago or New York or Los Angeles, something along those lines. Um, and you know, it's very exclusive where, uh, a lot of people might be a little bit scared to go into like a Tiffany and company just because, you know, it is, you know, very kind of like a rich and type of prestigious, uh, type of place. Whereas, you know, uh, with the website, I mean, that's open to anybody. Anybody can go out there. I mean, you're not going to get judged for going out to the website. I mean, you can go out there, you can look, uh, you know, can kind of do a little bit of daydreaming and window shopping, if you will, um, and kind of see, you know, what else is out there. So as far as, you know, the challenges associated with that is just uh, <clears throat> a lot of, uh, you know, luxury retailers uh, probably are getting a lot of people who are visiting their websites that maybe aren't interested in actually buying something. They're just kind of window shopping, you know, at that point. Then, you know, how has social media affected luxury marketing? Um, I think it's done a couple of different things as far as it, it, a lot of people see, uh, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, professional athletes or actors, actresses, you know, models, whoever it is, um, through social media sites such as like Instagram and everything, they might be, um, you know, wearing designer clothes or, you know, driving Ferraris or Mercedes Benz or whatever it is. Um, I think that's done a huge thing for luxury marketing just because a lot of people kind of aspire to be that rich one day. And, you know, you do a lot of like daydreaming with it. Whereas, you know, in years past where we didn't have social media and you didn't have kind of that, uh, you know, luxury marketing out there, uh, a lot of people didn't know about some of these luxury brands. It was just mainly just for, you know, kind of the, the rich and elite. Whereas now it's becoming, you know, much more prominent on, you know, social media. And a lot of people can go out, like maybe it's like a, something like a Rolex watch where you can go out, you can like their, you know, Facebook page and you can follow them. Um, even though you might not own a Rolex watch and, and maybe you, you know, maybe not even have the funds available um, to buy one at any point in your life. You can still, you know, kind of follow them, see kind of what changes they are, and it just kind of gives somebody like a little bit of, you know, aspirations and dreams of, you know, possibly what could be, you know, in the future. Um, and then as far as you know, visit the Netaporter website. Uh, you know, I'm going to let you guys go out there to that website and kind of explore, uh, you know, what it is. You know, I don't want to give away anything at this point. I think that's kind of a good thing for you guys to go out and see. Um, also, you know, in chapter six, there's a really good kind of write up about, uh, you know, the differences between, you know, retail marketing and luxury marketing. So I uh, highly recommend that you guys go out uh, and read that. So other online marketing strategies, you have, uh, you know, customer retention strategies uh, or one-to-one -one marketing. Um, this is all about personalization. Um, and then you've got behavioral targeting, which is interest-based, uh, you know, advertising. So I know if you do have, uh, maybe you're <clears throat> really big into, uh, you know, baseball, um, <clears throat> you're going on to like Rawlings or Wilson.com um, looking for like baseball gloves and different things like that, uh, you know, obviously, um, you know, baseball is going to be kind of like your primary interest and then you're probably going to start seeing, you know, a lot more of, you know, ads pop up for like baseball related, uh, you know, items, uh, customization, customer, uh, co-production. 
to go along with that. And then also you have customer service such as FAQs, uh, real-time or customer service chat systems, and then automated response systems. Uh, so you know, if you go onto somebody's website, uh, more than likely they're going to have an FAQ section, uh, your real-time customer service uh, chat systems. Um, I've actually used this quite a bit with uh, Verizon. That way, you know, if I do have a question about like my bill or you know, uh, possibly like upgrading to like a different plan or something like that, I can just do their you know real-time customer service chat. That way, I don't have to call anybody. Um, just because a lot of times you get put on hold and you have to sit there for a while. Where you know, if I'm doing something, uh, you know, if I'm at work and uh, you know I have a little bit of a kind of spare time. I can start that you know uh, real-time uh, service chat with them, and then I can also be working as I'm chatting with that individual. Uh, pricing strategies. So uh, you know, pricing this is an integral uh, part of marketing strategy. Uh, traditional pricing uh, based on fixed costs, variable costs, and demand curve. Um, so you know, with that you have you know marginal costs and then marginal revenue. Uh, <clears throat> And then you've got a piggyback strategy, which is just kind of you know figuring out what your or your, what your competitors are doing, and you know picking back on uh, you know what they're doing for their price point, and then uh, you've got price discrimination um, as well. Uh, you know free for you know, free and freemium. So maybe you're offering kind of a free initial um, <clears throat> like product uh, to get somebody a little bit interested um, into uh, you know joining your product. Uh, you've got uh, versioning, or maybe like Pepsi. Uh, they offer you know different versions of Pepsi, whether it be Diet Pepsi, you know, Pepsi One, uh, you know Pepsi with you know uh, vanilla in it, whatever it might be. Uh, you know bundling. Uh, with that, you know a lot of times we typically think about like uh, AT and T, Direct TV. They do a lot of bundling uh, with their products, and then you also have uh, dynamic pricing, uh, such as like auctions, uh, yield management, surge pricing, uh, and then flash marketing. Uh, long tail marketing. So uh, the internet allows for sales of obscure products with little demand. Uh, so substantial revenue because uh, you know near zero inventory costs, little marketing costs, and then search and uh, recommendation engines. Uh, so you know with long tail marketing, uh, <clears throat> a lot of things that we've seen uh, kind of come out of that has been based on like social media groups. Uh, you know the one that kind of comes to mind is like Surge Soda, um, where there was a lot of like online communities saying you know, bring Surge Soda back. Um, and what they were able to kind of do was kind of figure out, you know, how many people were actually interested in drinking surge, and then they brought it out for like a very, you know, short amount of time, sold it through Amazon. So there was relatively no cost associated with them. They didn't have to roll out like a whole lot of advertising with it. It was kind of like a word of mouth. Um, a lot of uh, <clears throat> the uh, advertising was done through social media, just um, from consumer to consumer. Um, and then, you know, uh, Coke at that time didn't have to do any commercials or, you know, uh, do any billboards or anything like that. It was just kind of like an online presence. Uh, web transaction logs. So uh, these are uh, built into web server software. Uh, these record uh, user activity at a website, uh, provides much uh, marketing data, especially combined with uh, registration forms and shopping cart database. Uh, so answer questions such as, you know, what are the major patterns of interest and purchases? And then uh, after home page, where do users uh, go first? And then second, so, you know, if you're going online to, you know, maybe like oldnavy.com, you know, are you going to look at the jeans first? Or are you going to look at shirts? You know, are, uh, you know, <clears throat> people looking at kids' co clothes first? Uh, and then what are your overall patterns? Are you just kind of looking around at the website? Or are you actually, uh, you're putting stuff into your shopping cart? Or is it just kind of like, you know, window shopping at that point? So uh, data warehouses and uh, data mining. So a data warehouse, this uh, collects firms' transactional and customer data uh, in a single location for offline analysis by uh, marketers um, and site managers. And then you've got data mining, which is analytical uh, techniques to find patterns and data, uh, model uh, behavior of customers, and then develop uh, customer profiles. Uh, so both are you know very uh, important factors whenever you're trying to figure out online behaviors, um, figuring out you know what exactly are your customers looking at, what are they uh, you know kind of thinking, whatever they're going through, uh, <clears throat> you know their website, and both play a role in it. So how well does uh, online advertising work? So uh, the use of a return of, on investment uh, to measure an ad campaign. So you know if you invested a million dollars in an ad campaign, you want to make sure that you have you know a million dollar in profit based on uh, that item that you're selling. So uh, you know the difficulty of cross-platform uh, attribution um, plays a role in that. Highest uh, click-through rates. So search engine ads, uh, permission email campaigns. Um, and then you also have online channels compare favorably with traditional. And then most, mark, uh, most powerful marketing 
campaigns, excuse me, use uh, multi-channels, including online, catalog, TV, radio, uh, newspapers, and stores. So, uh, you know, kind of like what we talked about throughout this chapter is, you know, kind of having a good mix between, you know, online and kind of your old school traditional, you know, ad campaigns will typically have the best uh, results on it. Uh, we are starting to see more and more people just go to, uh, you know, online just because with uh, such uh, a bigger presence online and a lot of stores are just, you know, strictly online anymore. So some marketing analytics, so uh, software that analyzes data uh, at each stage of the customer conversion uh, process. So uh, you've got the overall awareness, uh, you know, engagement. Are they engaged in your website? Uh, how much interaction are they having with it? Purchase activity and then loyalty and post-purchase. Are they coming back and looking to your website again? Are they, you know, uh, repeat customers on it? Are they creating an account uh, with your website? So this also helps managers, you know, optimize you know, return on investment on website marketing efforts, uh, build detailed customer uh, profiles, and then measure impact of marketing campaigns. So that's all I've got for Chapter 6. We will see you next time in Chapter 7.